Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture of this course, Introduction to Cultural Studies. Uh, now we just finished uh, looking at Edward Said's Orientalism and looking at the way how that book is a magnificent document, a magnificent study of the politics of production of the other, the other identity. And how is the other uh, profoundly ideological, profoundly political, profoundly epistemic. Uh, so the idea of producing the other is the idea of producing the, the cons consolidating the hegemonic identity of the uh, decolonizer. In the case of colonialism, is a colonizer. In the case of uh, patriarchy, is a male. Uh, in the case of caste system, a superior caste, etc. So the other must be produced uh, incessantly, endlessly, in order to consolidate, in order to prove, legitimize, sanction uh, the authority, the, the agency, the supremacy uh, of the hegemonic. Uh, you know, hegemonic individual, hegemonic race, hegemonic um, condition. Now, uh, what we do in this particular lecture is we look at a more complicated essay. So, what Said does very brilliantly, and the reason why we look at Orientalism as a foundational text, is he is probably the first philosopher, the first historian who comes up with this idea uh, of looking at, at a gaze of the European, the Eurocentric gaze, which sort of reifies, which measures, which uh, contains, which exoticizes, which essentializes the other, the non-European. Now, when you come to someone like Homi Bhabha, which the person whom the, the, the essay which we'll study today is, a, is an essay by Homi Bhabha called The Other Question. When you come to someone like Homi Baba, you find that this is a, he takes a more uh, complicated and more problematic stance when it comes to the idea of the other. He looks at the other not just uh, as uh, an inferior person, as uh, someone who is sort of strate strategically considered to be inferior, strategically uh, produced as an inferior person, know that, but someone or something or a certain section, a certain category which is incessantly produced over and over again to certain stereotypes, to certain ambivalences and the key word over here is ambivalence. So we will start the essay by looking at how uh, Bhava talks about ambivalence. So what is the ambivalence in the politics of production of the other, the politics of uh, the identity of production of the other, okay. So this is Homi Bhava's The Other Question. So uh, at the very beginning of the essay we find, I've sort of highlighted the sections which we'll study in details, the, the yellow highlights are the ones which are important for us for the purpose of this particular lecture. And he says quite clearly, an important feature of colonial discourse is its dependence on the concept of fixity and the ideological construction of otherness. Fixity as a sign of cultural, historical, racial difference is a discourse of colonialism. It is a paradoxical mode of representation. It connotes rigidity and unchanging order as well as disorder, degeneracy and demonic reputation. So, I mean look at the adjectives, disorder, degeneracy, demonic reputation. So, these are very convenient attributes which are invested uh, in, the, in, the, in the process of producing the other, right. So, the other is degenerate by default, the other is uh, demonic by default, the other is disordered by default. Likewise, the stereotype, which is its major discursive strategy, the stereotype as a strategy is very, very important, is a form of knowledge and identification that vacillates between what is always in place, already known and something that must be anxiously repeated, uh, as if the essential duplicity of the Asiatic or the bestial sexual license of the African that needs no proof can never really in discourse be proved. It is this process of ambivalence central to the stereotype that my essay explodes and as it constructs a theory of colonial discourse. So, you know, uh, what is this ambivalence that Baba talks about? It might sound a bit complicated, but actually it's a, it's a very simple, elegant theory. And the theory is, when we create the other, when we create the excessive, demonic, degenerate, disordered other, uh, we assume two things. A, that is, uh, the other is you know, uh, disordered by default, the other is degenerate by default and secondly, the degeneracy, the disordered uh, quality, uh, the demonic quality of the other must be endlessly and anxiously repeated. So, this is ambivalence. So, on one hand you are saying it is fixatum, on the one hand you are saying this is a stereotype, this is something which is permanently a condition of the other, on the other hand you are anxiously repeating it over and over again. So, the point is, you are repeating uh, as if uh, the, the sexual license of the African, the bestiality uh, of the African, the duplicity of the Asiatic, the very, very racist, offensive categories of classification, uh, you know, these things must be repeated in popular discourse over and over again because uh, the ambivalences, uh, these things need no proof but it can never really be proved. So, hence the repeatability, it, hence the need to repeat these things over and over again, right. And therein lies the ambivalence. So, 
on one hand is fixity that these things don't require any proof these are known by default these are like super epistemic uh, knowledge super epistemic categories on the other hand these things must be repeated over and over again right i mean there must be an endless circulation of the bestiality of the african the duplicity of the asiatic in order to prove or hammer home the point of the other formation Therein lies the ambivalence. So it's very important to understand uh, the, the politics of ambivalence over here. So ambivalence over here is an affect, is an affective category, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, is also a political category. And again, we find this collusion between, this combination between affect and politics, uh, very, very handy, very convenient and very complex that comes into play in any study, in any serious study of culture and cultural identity formations. So, uh, and this is what Bauer goes on to say, that um, for it is a force of ambivalence that gives a colonial stereotype its currency. So the current stereotype comes from the ambivalence, right? This idea of fixity and repeatability. The, 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 the two mutually apparently contradictory ideas are fixity and, and, and repeatability, but actually these are ontological complements of one another when it comes to the stereotype and shows its repeatability in changing historical and discursive conjuncture. So, the historical conjuncture might change, the, the, the discursive conjuncture might change, but then the repeatability of this uh, stereotypes, the repeatability of the signifiers uh, must be retained, right? Informs the strategic, uh, the strategies of individuation and marginalization, produces and the effect the, of probabilistic truth and predictability, which for the stereotype must always be in excess of what can be empirically proved or logically construed, right? So, this is a very default mechanism of the stereotype that it must, it exists at an excess from what is empirically proved, from what is empirically verifiable, right? So, the whole idea of the stereotype is its location in excess. It is, it is required to be located in an excessive condition where it is removed from the verifiability, uh, empirical evidence, etc. And that's the whole point of having a stereotype, okay? So the stereotype is both an arrestation arrest and a play. It's both a fixity and a play. So therein lies the ambivalence of a stereotype and this ambivalence gives the stereotype its currency, the currency of a circulation in different historical formations and different cultural formations and different discursive formations. Okay, so this is the beginning of the essay. So we find this is a very, very impactful essay. It carries a lot of impact and in many ways it's very original as well. Because what Bhava does, he looks at the way how this ambivalence becomes a very essential category, a very essential condition of the circulation of the stereotype. Right, okay. Uh, Next, we come to the idea of the productive ambivalence that Bhava talks about. The productive ambivalence of the, of the object of the colonial discourse, that otherness, which is at once an object of desire and derision, an articulation of difference contained within the fantasy of origin and identity. So, you know, uh, it, it sounds like an oxymoron in terms, right? Productive ambivalence, but that, that's exactly what Bhava is saying that this ambivalence is productive, it produces certain knowledge, it produces uh, certain discursive knowledge formation, uh, it produces the other iron, uh, identity formation, the identity of the other is produced through this ambivalence, hence it's productive, right? So it literally produces something and hence the, it has a constructed quality to it. Now, the otherness which is at once the object of desire and duration. So, it's something which is desired, the other is desired, it's exotic, it's essentialized, it's romantic, as I saw when we looked at Edward Said. But at the same time, it's something which can be derided, something which can be ridiculed, something which can be mocked at, something which can be uh, challenged and questioned because it was inadequacy. So, again, look at there is, there is a degree of ambivalence here as well. So, it is excessive as well as inadequate. So, the excessive is a desired bit. So, you desire the excessive bit. It is excessive, it is romantic, it is um, exoticized, it is essentialized and all of that. But at the same time, what is derided at is this insufficiency. It is to a great extent insufficient, uh, inadequate. So, this play between inadequacy and excess is something which gives currency to the other, you know, the, uh, the identity of the other. Uh, so, when you come to this and next we uh, move on to uh, Another important section, the colonial discourse as an apparatus of power. Now, 
uh, we have already seen how uh, Sai talks about power as a very important tool for identity production. So, whoever has power, I mean, not just talking about military power or physical or corporeal power, but also discursive power. Uh, who controls the discourse? Who controls the dominant discourse? Uh, what's the currency of the dominant discourse? So, where does hegemony lie at a discursive level, at an epistemic level? Who controls knowledge? And other, and other other words. So that's why I mean that's what, what I mean when I say epistemic, right? Who controls knowledge? Who produces knowledge? Who's the producer of knowledge? Uh, who's the manipulator of knowledge? Uh, who's the representer or representator of knowledge? So and who ensures the knowledge is represented in a particular discursive way? So that what, what that is what uh, Power talks about when he says the colonial apparatus as an uh, discourse as an apparatus of power, right? The entire uh, machinery, the entire arsenal uh, of uh, knowledge formation, knowledge containment, knowledge dissemination is a very important arsenal when it comes to colonial subject formation, colonial identity formation. Right. So, what is this apparatus? What is the function of this apparatus uh, that, that Bhava uh, describes or looks at? And I'm reading out from the highlighted section over here up on the screen. It's an apparatus that turns on the recognition and disavowal of racial, cultural, historical differences. Its predominant strategic function is the creation of a space for a subject peoples through the production of knowledges in terms of which surveillance is exercised and a complex form of pleasure and pleasure is incited. It seeks authorization for its strategies by the production of knowledge, knowledges of colonizer and colonized, which is stereotypical but antithetically evaluated. The objective of colonial discourse is to constitute the colonized as a population of degenerate types on a basis of racial origin, in which, in order to justify the conquest and to establish systems of administration and instruction. Now, uh, there is a very loaded definition, as you can see, but certain keywords are very important. Uh, knowledge in which, uh, through which surveillance is exercised. What kind of knowledge is that? Through which surveillance is exercised. So that is a knowledge which is a very coded knowledge, which is something which through which the other is subjugated, through which the other is uh, colonized, and not just physically or bodily or corporeally, but also epistemically, also you know uh, ontologically, also discursively, right? And now. This surveillance it generates its own pleasure and pleasure principle, right? So when you contain the colonial subject, the colonial other, uh, and through a surveillance system, that generates the pleasure in its own right, a very voyeuristic, narcissistic pleasure uh, from the colonizer. Uh, also, unpleasure because there's always a threat uh, of the break of surveillance. There's always a threat of the subversion of surveillance. So that's unpleasure bit. Now that knowledge, the colonial knowledge of domination, control, hegemony, it seeks authorization for its strategies by the production of knowledge as a colonizer and colonized, which is stereotypical but antithetically evaluated. Now what do I mean? What, what does power mean by this? Uh, it's, it's sort of essentially a knowledge of stereotypes. So the colonizer and colonized, they're created through stereotypes. So the colonizer is always superior. The colonizer is white. The colonizer is supreme. The colonizer has agency. Is civilizationally superior, etc. Whereas the colonized is just the opposite, right? It's inferior, depraved, degenerate, disordered, insane, hysterical, irrational, anarchic, and all of that. Now. Uh, you can see from this very definition that these are stereotypes, but these are antithetically evaluated. So the tools of evaluation, the measures of evaluation are completely different, right? So this this is a precondition. The result is you know preconditioned. Uh, the inference is preconditioned, and the the apparatus now is manipulated in order to arrive at the inference, the discursive inference of the superiority of the colonizer. Okay. So the objective of colonial discourse, what does colonial discourse want essentially, is to construe the colonized as a population of degenerate types. So this is not very hard to understand. Uh, it's very important for the colonial program, for the colonial machinery uh, to construct a machinery, to construct, to produce a knowledge which will, you know, keep confirming the degeneracy of the colonized. That will obviously legitimize the territorialization of the colonizer. It will legitimize the supremacy of the, of the colonizer, the supposed supremacy of the colonizer. It will legitimize the control, the domination of the colonizer. And you know, more importantly, it will describe, it will help sanction uh, colonialism as some kind of a grand rescuing mission, right? Because the, the colonized people are so degenerate, they need to be rescued from themselves. Therein lies the nobility of the colonizer who come in with the you know entire colonial apparatus of education, reformation, emancipation, etc. Okay, so you know this this the long and short of how colonial knowledge formation operates. This is the long and short of how colonial knowledge formation um, you know becomes political uh, and how it colludes uh, with 
with military, with medicine, with law, with all kinds of other uh, parameters of control. And we talked about, uh, if you remember, when you mentioned Althusser in the previous lecture, we talked about ISA and RSA, ideological state of parameters and repressive state of parameters. And this is a very good example of that. Knowledge over here becomes ideology. Uh, it, it is produced out of the ideological state of parameters like the church, like the court, like the prison, uh, you know, like the school, etc. The prison, of course, is RSA, repressive state of parameters. And, you know, they go hand in hand, okay, in terms of how knowledge is controlled and contained. So, not only is the colonizers supremacy uh, protected at the level of the body, the body of the colonizer must be protected, but also and more importantly, the knowledge of the colonizer supremacy must be protected as well. You know, if you can't protect that, then that, you know, uh, you know, that completely crashes the entire machinery of colonialism, because the entire machinery of colonialism is dependent, is reliant on a discursive difference between the colonizer and the colonized, to support supremacy of the colonizer as against the supposed degeneracy of the colonized. And this, this binary, this antithetical evaluation is maintained, uh, is manipulated, is engineered, uh, if you will, through a very, very discursively constructed apparatus of knowledge. And this is what Power mentions when he means when he says apparatus of recognition. Okay. So, uh, now when you come to uh, the next section, despite the play in the colonial system which is crucial to its exercise of power, colonial discourse produces the colonized as a fixed reality which is at once and other and yet entirely knowable and visible. Now look at the ambivalence over here. Uh, there is a play in the colonial system, there is a con continuous movement in the colonial system, but despite the movement, uh, what is fixated, what never changes uh, in a colonial machinery is the fixated quality of the colonized. Right? And you know, the colonized as a fixed reality of depravity, degeneracy, disorder, inferiority, etc., which is at once and other and yet entirely knowable and visible. So this is another level of ambivalence over here. The other, the colonized over here, is someone who is you know depraved and you know someone who should be uh, one, one should be fearful of, etc. But at the same time, uh, that colonized subject is entirely knowable, is entirely known. You know, we can know, we know everything about him. We know everything about the colonial subject, and then is entirely visible as well. So it becomes, and the whole idea is a desire to classify, the desire to codify, the desire to put the colonized subject into a code, a very convenient code of depravity. Uh, degeneracy, inferiority, etc. It resembles a form of narrative whereby the productivity and circulation of subjects and signs abound in a reformed and recognizable totality. It employs a system of representation, a regime of truth with, that is structurally similar to realism. Now, this is a very, very important section. I'll spend some time on this. What is realism? Realism is a kind of narrative strategy, those of you from literary background would know. Realism is a kind of narrative strategy which is totalizing. And what do I mean by totalizing? Uh, the, real, the realist narrator is an all-knowing narrator, someone who knows everything about what's happening in the character's heads, what's happening in the character's lives. There is an overseeing, omnipresent, omniscient presence. Right? Uh, the narrator of a realist novel is omniscient omnipresent, omnipotent, is a godlike narrator. There is no unreliability, no uncertainty in the narrator at all. Now that becomes a totalizing technique. Uh, totalizing, by totalizing I mean, uh, you know, the technique through which everyone is known, everything is known, everything that passes in the brains, the heads of the subjects, the characters are entirely known uh, to the narrator. And if you replace the narrator with a colonizer way, we find this is exactly how colonial machinery operates. Uh, it, it operates through a realist process. Right, a totalizing process where there's no uncertainty, where there's no unknowability about the other. The other is entirely known, the other is entirely recognized or recognizable, despite the depravity, despite the degeneracy, despite the inferiority. Okay? So this is again uh, the 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 it's a, it's a kind of narrative, as Baba says. It resembles a form of narrative whereby the productivity and circulation of subjects and science abound in a reformed and recognizable totality. Recognizable totality is a totality which is entirely recognizable. Because why recognizable? Because it's created out of a Eurocentric system, a Eurocentric system of classification. So it's obviously it is definitely recognizable. Okay. Uh, 
And it employs a system of representation. It, it is a kind of representation. It is a kind of narrative, which includes certain things, which excludes certain things. So representation, as you know, uh, is a form of inclusion as well as exclusion. Right? You include certain things, you also exclude certain things. And inclusion, exclusion is a very political processes. Right. Now, um, and it is in order to intervene within the system of representation that Edward Said proposes a semiotic of Orientalist power, examining the varied European discourses which constitute the Orient as a unified racial, geographical, political, and cultural zone of the world. Now, this is uh, an allusion to Said, a tribute to Said, a tribute to the uh, monumental work that Said created through uh, Orientalism. Now, what Bhava does is that this is exactly what Said uses in order to understand how the West created the Orient. The West created the Orient through a process of production, uh, through a process of discursive production, through which the Orient becomes something which is romantic, excessive, um, you know, um, exotic, essentialized, but at the same time, entirely knowable entirely uh, recognizable a true or totalizing technique you know the, the exoticization the exotic quality the romantic quality of the orient is something which can be completely contained within a totalizing grand narrative that european is using in order to understand the orient so you know you can see how this particular essay and i've very carefully chosen these uh, works how they dialogue with each other right so how uh, baba Oweya, he gives a tribute to Sai. Uh, there's a certain critique of Sai as well but he obviously acknowledges Sai's massive and profound work of Orientalism, which is used very effectively to study the process of identity formation of the other, which is what we're talking about in this lecture. Now, and again, he then moves on to sort of critique Sai to a certain extent. He sort of says that Sai's idea of Orientalism is a simple idea which needs to be complicated, right? And he says, there is always in Sai the suggestion that colonial power and discourse is possessed entirely by the colonizer, which is a historical and theoretical simplification. The terms in which Sai's Orientalism is unified, the intentionality and unidirectionality of colonial power also unify the subject of colonial enunciation. Now, and this is a very debatable uh, argument that Bhava is making. Uh, and he's saying that, you know, in Said, uh, despite the historical and profound uh, cultural influence of Said's Orientalism, there's a problem in Said's book. And that is, uh, he, he acknowledges the Orient and Occident as two fixed binaries, right? These are things, uh, you know, this is a tool, this is an instrument, this is a prism to which Said looks at Orientalism or devices his book Orientalism. Now, he sort of assumes according to Bhava, the colonial power is possessed entirely by the colonizer, which is a simplification in terms. And what Bhava is doing here, he is drawing on side, he is using side, and then is complicating the mechanism the side has had, had propounded in Orientalism. Now, he says essentially that uh, the idea of power is more problematic, the idea of power is more complicated than just, you know, a binary of, you know, powerful and powerless. It doesn't just re rest rely entirely on the colonizer, and it's not as if the colonized person is entirely powerless. Power becomes a very political process. Power becomes a very slippery plastic process. It becomes a performance. It becomes a performative act, a mimetic act to a certain extent, right? And this is where uh, Sai uh, Baba talks, sort of departs from Sai to a certain extent, and then uh, gives a very uh, different, albeit uh, you know, similar, structurally similar view of Orientalism and power knowledge. Now, then you come to Foucault, and we will spend some more time with Foucault later uh, in this course, but it's useful to understand how Bhava looks at Foucault in terms of looking at the entire power knowledge paradigm uh, that characterizes colonialism, that characterizes the colonial condition. And uh, he says, Foucault stresses that the relations of knowledge and power within the apparatus are always a strategic response to an urgent need at a given historical moment. So, you know, the entire uh, relationship between knowledge and power Power becomes knowledge, knowledge becomes power, and Foucault is a, a study of knowledge and power. Now, that is basically a response, it's a bit of a knee jerk response, if you will, to a certain historical need at a certain point of time, a certain need for domination, a certain need for colonial control, a certain need for hegemony, etc. So, that produces this uh, power knowledge paradigm that Foucault makes, make, makes so famous in his works. Uh, the force of colonial discourse as a theoretical and political intervention was a need in our contemporary moment to contest singularities of difference and to articulate modes of differentiation. And Foucault writes, the apparatus is essentially of a strategic nature, which means assuming that it's a matter of certain manipulation of relations and forces, either developing them in a particular direction, blocking them, stabilizing them, utilizing them, etc. 
And the apparatus is just always inscribed in a play of power, but it's also always linked to certain coordinates of knowledge which issue from it, but to an equal degree condition it. This is what the apparatus can this consists in strategies of relations and forces supporting and supported by types of knowledge. So, you know, Foucault is most famous for the idea of knowledge as a political process, the idea of knowledge as hegemony, the idea of knowledge as something which is, you know, used very effectively in colonial condition uh, to, to control, contain, measure, survey uh, a certain population. And this is exactly what uh, Foucault talks about over here, and power draws on him in order to support his arguments. Right. So, uh, then we move on to another very important term that Bhava uses, something which is uh, profound in terms of looking at how other formation, the formation of the other is, you know, is, happens, is operative, is produced uh, through a political process. The term that, that uh, Bhava uses is a term called fetish. What is a fetish? The fetish or stereotype gives access to an identity which is predicated as much on mastery and pleasure as is on anxiety and defense. For it's a form of multiple and contradictory belief in its recognition of difference and disavowal of it. This conflict of pleasure on pleasure, mastery defense, knowledge disavowal, absence presence has a fundamental significance for colonial discourse. For the scene of fetishism is also the scene of the reactivation and reputation of primal fantasy, the subject's desire uh, for a pure origin that is always threatened by its division, for the subject must be gendered in order to be engendered to be spoken. Now, what is this fetish? The fetish is this uh, very interesting play between absence and presence, between knowledge and disavowal, between desire and dread between pleasure and unpleasure, right, between anxiety and defense. So, in the fetish is a very contradictory construction of a certain identity, right. So, you have a fetish for a certain identity, you have a fetish for a certain colonial condition, which basically means there's a degree of anxiety about it, there's anxiety of losing it, there's anxiety of losing something you already have, but at the same time, there's also a desire to have something that you don't have. And this play between desire and death, this play between anxiety and aspiration, is something which categorizes a fetish. So, the scene of fetishism, as Bhava studies it, is also the scene of the reactivation and reputation of the primal fantasy, the, the scene of pure origin, the desire for a pure origin, a pure starting point, which never existed in the first place, right? And that becomes a, a scene through which a fetish is produced, right? The colonial fetish, the racial fetish, uh, the, the gendered fetish, etc. So, you know, just to conclude this essay today, uh, what Bhava is doing over here. He's taking a very poor structuralist understanding of the colonial condition of knowledge and power, a very poor structuralist understanding of the colonial condition of identity formation. So, the identity of the other is not a simple process. It's a process which is very complicated, a process which is very poor structuralist because what it entails is not just desire but also absence, anxiety. So, the way the other is produced in a colonial condition also, you know, entails a certain degree of anxiety, a certain degree of absence, a certain degree of uh, threat, a certain degree of ambivalence, right? It's not just a straight, linear, complicated, uncomplicated process to which the other is produced by attributing stereotypes, by attributing uh, certain uh, derogatory knowledge, etc. It's not that simple. It's a more complicated process because what it also con contains and conditions is the idea of ambivalence, the idea of anxiety the idea of threat. And this is what we should be studying at, uh, we should be looking at when we look at the condition through which the other is produced as a political process in a colonial condition. So, I conclude the lecture today uh, and I hope you get something out of it. Please read this um, uh, highlighter sections carefully and we will continue with the rest of the essay in a lecture next time. Thank you for your attention.